racing fan, Monday morning racer here for another quarantine special under all this coronavirus happenings that we're dealing with here in 2020. And we have got with you here on dragracing.tv, powered by strutmasters.com, a entire gang, the Rodfather gang, the Caruso family racing gang with hired hitman Alex Laughlin on the zoom cast very quickly i'm going to let them introduce themselves and we'll dive into this interview caruso family racing mark caruso papa joe caruso go ahead alex oh my bad i'm alex laughlin <laughs> what's up guys <laughs> i'm lee white and i'm Hank Jackson. all right guys there is everybody that we've got on the zoom cast today and as you have noticed, you got in the background there with Hank and Lee, the World Door Slammer Nationals winning car and that big, huge check. And you got the Carusos, the owner. Alex was driving that bad machine there for that event. Won it all. Guys, give me the rundown on the weekend, the struggles, obviously the triumph, what it was like to win a drag racing first for so much money. There's not that many more drag racing firsts in our day and time. Well, I yep. think uh, either Alex or uh, Lee should answer that question, maybe both, because I'd think i love to hear both their perspectives from, from testing till the final round. I would like, uh, I'd like Lee to take this one, you know, especially starting off, uh, yeah, right from the very beginning. <laughs> all right, well, uh, Basically, it was all flawless. Testing was great, and the race was good, right? <laughs> That's the way it goes. Uh, no, That's the way I remember it. Yeah, I mean, we started out kind of rough and um, had some silly stuff happen, but um, never had met Alex before. And I'm kind of funny about people I work with, so I don't know. I had a lot going on, so the first day was kind of different, and testing started going well once we got some stuff sorted out. and. The, the the actual race was was really good. Alex is probably one of the calmest, most relaxed drivers I've ever seen. To the point, I wish he could get a little hyped up sometimes. But uh, <laughs> I think the only time Alex gets excited is when the parachutes are out and he's wandering around. I think that's the only time I hear excitement in his voice. Yeah, I could uh, probably agree with that too. He's the most laid back, calm person I ever met, and and I've noticed that. I think it was first round the car wouldn't start we couldn't get it to start the other guy did the burnout bagged up finally the car finally started alex rolls through the car box knocks the dirt off the tires and pulls in the lights never never missed a beat he was calm and kept himself together real well so i was i was me and hank both were very impressed with the way he handled himself and he did the same the rest of the day Please. we had a. Uh, I think second round, the car started to shake a little bit, and Alex realized it really early, so he pedaled it just enough to, to go down the racetrack, and we went 582 at 248 pedaling, so he did a really exceptional job driving, kept me out of trouble, so I was appreciative. Yeah, he did impress me. <laughs> <laughs> but he did good all weekend, and uh, all in all, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad he stepped up to drive, and I'm looking forward to us running some more races with him. Yeah, same here. And uh, not not to just uh, you know sit here and be fluffing each other, you know, so much. But <coughs> I will agree too that uh, you know, as far as Lee White, that's a name that you know a lot of people haven't heard, like in the pro mod tuning ranks, at least within NHRA, you know, a lot. And uh, you know, a lot of people have said that he's an underestimated crew chief, and I would say that uh, he's he is no longer underestimated. Um, we had by far the most consistent race car all weekend long, and uh, you know he apologized whenever we shook there, and uh, I said, you know what, that's uh, that's why we're a team. It takes both of us because there was a round two that I was a tiny bit tardy on the tree. And uh, we only won that round against Beely by a fourth out. And uh, that was that one was on him uh, to, to save us that round win. So all in all, it does take a team of, uh, of everybody to be able to connect all the dots. And what a great team it is with the Caruso family racing and the tuning that's involved from Lee White and Hank over there. Uh, 
Caruso's look, talk to me. Mark, you're a good pro mod driver in your own right. I was watching some tape earlier today. You've been in some pedal sessions and you've really got on and off the throttle, hooked that thing back up, and made it into the show or won the race. So you know how to will these things. What has transpired and why weren't you in the car? How'd you get Alex in the car? I mean, he's in everything, he can drive anything, but how'd you get him in the seat? Well, to back up to the very beginning uh, of part of your question there, um, I pretty much owe everything racing to this man sitting here on my left, my father, um, and we'll let him uh, speak a little bit on his, you know, past and, and his experience with racing and stuff. But basically, um, I grew up around, you know, my father loving uh, racing and hot rods and street rods, you know, my my entire life. and. I got to sit in one of his uh, super gas cars when I turned 16. And um, so, I, you know, the, the racing, you know, I'm, I'm here it is 30 plus years late, later. So, yeah, I've got a little bit of experience. I kind of came up through the ranks. I didn't just all of a sudden sit in a pro mod car one day and um, start wheeling. So there's, there's, you know, over 30 years of racing um, behind me. But um, uh, as far as why I wasn't in the car, um, most people um, know that I was involved in a pretty serious uh, racing accident in Bristol last June um, where I broke my back, spent uh, quite a bit of time recovering from that only to find out that I now have post-traumatic arthritis uh, between my L3, L4 and L4, L5. So I have good days, bad days. Um, as of lately, I've actually been having more good days than bad days. So I'm pretty positive about that. You know, my plans were to uh, originally were to be in the car by the U.S. Street Nationals. That didn't work out. So Tommy D, uh, Tommy D. April drove for us there, um, which was another final round that Lee White and a great driver got us to. Um, and, um, you know, then the next plan was to, to be in Orlando and that wasn't looking real promising either. Camry happened to be out in Pomona um, working. She's working with Elite on Erica's car. And so she happened to be out in Pomona and Alex was there and they got to chit chatting. And he said how he would like to drive ProMod this year and he didn't have a car for NHRA ProMod. And Camry says, I just might happen to know where there might be one you could possibly fit into. And uh, so Alex and I talked a couple, two, three times and made it happen. Um, when I first told Lee White about it, uh, he was as, you know, he said he don't warm up to people just quite, you know, right away. So he was a little leery <laughs> at first, but uh, um, I think uh, Alex will forever have a place in uh, Lee's uh, race car seat if there's ever one available. I was hoping you would say hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that that's what I really meant. <laughs> we, we, we bonded for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so alex you the winning driver look big payday a first in drag racing i'm sure you're still probably living off the high of that deal i've got one question though dude you didn't hold the baby gator and then later on i see you petting an elephant what's going on dude I'm not, I'm not really down with like reptiles and these snakes and stuff. Like the snake is one of the, the, like, that's the thing that I just am not down with at all. And, uh, that little gator is like a, a big snake with legs. And, uh, I don't know if you saw, but when I set it down on the ground in front of me, I think it could sense my fear because it like straight turns its head up and looks me directly in the eyes. And I'm like, I'm out, I'm out here. <laughs> I have pictures of it on my phone. What's that? I have pictures of all that on my phone. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't I wasn't amused for sure. <laughs> all right. Well guys, again, to each and every one of you, congratulations on your win there at the Drag Illustrated World Court Slammer Nationals presented by SeaTech Manufacturing. So Mark shared a little bit of his background in drag racing. Let's go ahead and look to you, Papa Joe. Tell me. Where did the drag racing bug bite? How did it bite? Because, I mean, you know, I look at Monroe County here in New York. There's not a racetrack anywhere. You got to go over near Buffalo. You got to go to Leicester. You got to go to Lime Rock for dirt track racing or Webster or Canandaigua. There's no racing going on, it seems like, in Monroe County. So how did you get hit with the drag racing bug? Well, I've been a, a car enthusiast 
since I was 10 years old. I think I owned my, I owned my first one at nine, not a drag race car, but a car. Um, when I was 15, I bought a car and uh, wanted to race it and hired a guy older than me, because I didn't have a license, to tow me to the racetrack with a chain. And uh, that's how it started. And uh, kind of never stopped from there. Uh, I've owned many cars um, over the years, uh, from bracket racing to super gas to top sportsman to pro mod. And, um, I uh, just kept on going from there. I, we used to race at a little 10th mile track called Spencer Speedway for quite a few years. And I had a, a good friend of mine who um, really couldn't afford to race, but loved to race. Uh, Mark was much younger at that time. And uh, we, uh, I put him in the car. We, we used to switch back and forth. And I'd say, whoever did the best in uh, time trials would race the car. Well, found out he was much better racer than I was. So I kept him in the car for 20 some odd years. And as Mark came through uh, and wanted to do that, he had uh, a car that he bought. Uh, it's actually a super street car. And from there went from that to super gas, to super comp, to top sportsman, to pro mod. So we've been racing a lot, a lot of years. And uh, I've been blessed to, uh, you know, have the means to do it. And now Camry, is in it. Um, the last couple of years been blessed with a team that, God, I, I, I can't tell you, could never do it without them. They're, they're, they're family, they're my children, you know? And, um, and now I just adopted Alex, so, you know, we're gonna keep on rocking and rolling. And we're not a, you know, high dollar team, but Lee keeps it all together. We had, make sure what, what we had one we had one piston in our trailer for the world yeah, Force yeah. Naturals. yeah. <laughs> we, we 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 know a lot of guys you know are lee out doesn't there. lee doesn't like the trailer to be overweight <laughs> we, yeah, we, 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 we gotta keep room for the uh, titos <laughs> yeah. right. priorities but, but we know there's a lot of guys out there with a lot of large budgets and they run them right on the ragged edge and um Lee's uh, shown everybody that we can run right with you, and we're, God willing, not tearing up a lot of stuff. So I'm so proud of, of, of Lee and Hank, my granddaughter, Camry, my son, you know, Alex, the, the whole team. I can't tell you um, how proud they make me. You know, it makes spending all this money worthwhile. <laughs> That's good to hear, Papa Joe. Now, look, since you have got the moniker Papa, you've been around for a while, obviously. I've got to ask, did you ever get to spend any time at the famed Niagara Drag Strip? And if you did, what was that like? Yes, I did. Back in the day, uh, I mean, that was the place. Just about anybody who was ever in drag racing professionally, uh, Jenkins and, and, and Perdome and and you go down the list, uh, Gartless, they all ran uh, Niagara. I mean, and that was just a old Air Force um, landing strip that they uh, turned into a drag strip. Uh, great times, great memories. Um, wish we could go back to those days. <laughs> it was a lot less expensive. <laughs> A lot less expensive, but hey, you and me, we've got to sit down before long. I've got some questions for you, so I'm, I need to get in contact with you later. I want to do some special things concerning Niagara Drag Strip so people know about it. You know, maybe, you never know, maybe something can come back alive once again over in that area, even more than just Lancaster, even though Vito is doing a great job over there yeah. currently. Let me move on down the line here. Hank, Lee, look. Tell me, how did you wind up in the drag racing world and, well, winning events like the World Door Slammer Nationals? Oh, boy. That's um, family. My dad raced. Um, it was actually the first time I went to the racetrack. It was the only thing I ever took a real liking to that I felt like invested my time into that I 
cared enough to really work at it because I was actually I'm kind of a lazy person at times. So if, if I'm not really interested, I don't care to work at it. Um, and then I've worked with a bunch of really great people. I've learned a whole lot from, you know, I've worked with Scotty Cannon. I talk with him daily, Al Billis. I learned a lot from them, Daryl Makins, a lot of people that's been around it for a long, long time. You know, I always call and, you know, us, us race car people, we'll talk on the phone for an hour or two on a normal day sometimes just about ideas and theories and nothing really. Um, but, you know, I just come through and worked on bracket cars, top sportsman cars, and got an opportunity to work on a pro extreme car when they had that class in PDRA. And that's how I met Al and him. And then kind of took up working on Al's car when all that was done and over. We raced PDRA with Tommy for a year, won a championship, learned a bunch from Al. And me and Al still work really closely together. We still keep his car too. Um, and it's really just a day in and day out. You live it and breathe it. And that's, uh, that's, that's really how you do good at it. You got to be committed. It's, it's a job, but uh, you couldn't make enough money for the hours you put in and get out of it, you know. So you just have to be committed. And then me and Hank met a long time ago, and I don't know, we just kind of worked together, and he can tell you for himself how he got in here. Well, on my family bracket, right, and I, my first full-time job was working on Scotty Cannon's uh, Nitro Funny Car. And then I'd done that for a while and then took a break. And then started hanging out with Lee, and he's been letting me ride his coat ever since. <laughs> and so it's just what we do. So guys, thank you for, guys, thank you for cluing us in. Uh, dropping Scotty Cannon's name, you know, coming originally from the upstate of South Carolina, that's the man, uh, Scotty <laughs> Cannon. But another man, a rising star, Alex Laughlin. Well, you know, he's just a rich boy that hasn't put no work in. We're not going to talk about him and let him share his story. No, no. Look, Alex, look, you've got some time here, please. People do think you're like this rich boy that's just been, you know, fed with a silver spoon. Tell us, clue us in. What kind of work have you put in to be at Elite Motorsports? You've driven in top alcohol. You're in pro mods. Uh, you do karting at Daytona, which I still haven't got to talk to you about. We will, though. But clue me in, man, how hard it took you to get to where you are. I'll tell you, the, the silver spoon thing comes up pretty often. And, uh, you know, I will I'll, – I'll start from the beginning. It's a long story that I'll make real short. Uh, my dad worked my tail off growing up. You know, if I wanted to get, you know, a dirt bike, if I wanted to get something, it was work all summer long after school – um, you know, to, to buy that $600 dirt bike that I wanted, you know, and uh, the bottom line was I, I definitely was raised right. Uh, my parents did a good job, so I commend them a lot on that. And uh, we've always had a, a family business where we build oil and gas flow line equipment. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to do some bracket racing growing up and whatnot um, in the, the karting and, and stuff like that. And uh, it was back in around uh, 2013 ish that uh, I always wanted to race pro stock. That was that was my dream, right? And uh, uh, you know, I was a big fan of of Jed Coughlin and and even Greg Anderson. And you know, it's crazy enough that here we are. You know, I'm racing against them now. Um, uh, Jed, for one, is my teammate. But it was back in about 2013 that. I, uh, I was at a race in Topeka, Kansas. I was running top dragster and long story short, I ended up meeting with Richard Freeman to discuss just the potential of running pro stock. And he told me what it cost to run a season. And I walked out of there with my head down and, you know, uh, realized that I would never in my life be able to afford to, to run pro stock. And, and really if, if they, you know, somebody told me I was to, to die tomorrow and I had, you know, one wish that, uh, that could be granted would be to, to do a burnout and let the clutch out in a pro stock car and just through some crazy events and people that I've met and relationships that I've built, it's, it's afforded me the opportunity to be able to hop into pro stock, have some success. Um, you know, I've gotten lucky at times and, uh, and had success on the racetrack and, um, 
over the last several years, it kind of just built a name for myself as far as in, in door cars. And, you know, I, I love, I love, I have the need for speed and running alcohol dragster, you know, the fastest I ran in that was, you know, around 280 miles an hour. And that still wasn't fast enough, you know, 260 in a door car that feels like 300. That's I'm, I'm pretty cool with that. Uh, it's, uh, especially like in the Crusoe car, every car has a different personality and to, to hop into something and it handles different. I mean, it's like, it's like totally learning for the first time again. And, uh, there's, there's no doubt that it'll, it'll get your nerves up for sure. But, uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, like what Lee was saying too, about just being calm. And that was something that I learned, I think just growing up racing from an early age that, um, you just have to be able to just slow everything down and, and process step by step exactly what it takes and, and uh, what it is, you know, one step at a time to get, you know, from start to finish. Because once the car starts and it's it's shaking and it's loud and adrenaline's flowing, it's so easy to to get freaked out, you know, and skip steps and and that's when mistakes happen. And so I just I always just try to stay as calm as possible. And now. I've like beat that in myself so much that sometimes I have to like trash talk myself in the car, you know, backing up after a burnout, you know, to get my mind dry to, to get hyped up. Well, Alex, definitely. I think you were raised right. You're doing a great job. U S national champion 2019 in pro stock. So you got one cross off the list. I'm sure champion of the whole deal for the NHRA is still on the list and, may very well get that soon enough we're not done yet though there is someone else here on the zoom interview you can barely see her over there with the caruso family racing it's uh camry right yes all right camry look tell me uh, obviously you're in a racing family but you've got a pretty special deal going on because you work with the fam but you're also working with elite motorsports because apparently you're hoping to let the clutch out on a pro stock car too as well yeah, I mean, pretty open to any race car that anyone will let me drive. I mean, I have a top dragster, and I've raced top alcohol dragster a few times. And hopefully we'll see if I can get in a door car soon enough. Well, you've got to stay in the uh, family MO. I've talked to several of these wayward children, whether it's Justin Ashley or Matt Smith, they've left the door car family. Y'all got to keep the kids in the doors and not let them get in these rails. Okay, well, I do like my drivers, not going to lie, but I definitely want to drive a door car, and hopefully that will come soon enough. Definitely, definitely. Well, I, I, I'm, I will be following your budding career. Definitely look forward to seeing you in. A door car. All right, Caruso family. We've got right we've now, got one more we've got one more guest. member oh, of the Caruso family. Oh. This is Mr. Mario. <laughs> well, hello, Mr. Mario. You are now the fifth fur baby, fur baby on all these quarantine special interviews. So it is obviously great to have Mr. Mario with uh, us this afternoon. Look, how how did y'all come by, Mr. Mario? Um, he's not really ours. He's, he's actually my, <laughs> my uh, girlfriend, Christy, who most of the people at the races know. Uh, Hank, Hank, and, uh, Hank and Lee know her very well because she keeps us very uh, oh, and hydrated. <laughs> uh, but this uh, Mr. Mario is Christy's dog. He's been part of our family for about four years now. <clears throat> he's a little fat. Well, then he fits in just fine. I'm not fat. <laughs> he's healthy. That's right. I mean, Alex will probably afford to lose a few pounds. <laughs> yeah, you are good. Everybody got to be somebody. <laughs> awesome. Well, having the pets along for the ride definitely makes it that much more enjoyable. So, Caruso's, look, that car there behind uh, Hank and Lee, it's kind of naked right now. The sponsor you had on with you all at Door Slammer Nationals, please share them with us. Great to have them on board, but what does it take to run a pro mod today for a single race and the full schedule? Well, what it takes, 
so I'll back up a little bit. So ATI was on board as a major sponsor, thanks to Alex. Alex put that deal together and it was a great deal. And we loved having Harvey there. And um, I'm pretty sure Harvey loved being there. Um, and uh, so that, that was awesome. And we also had Wright Trailers on board with us as an associate sponsor. Um, or at Speed Society, um, Alex had on there as well as Hot Wheels. Um, and then, you know, we have some, we have some manufacturers that help us out too. NGK Spark Plugs is a big part of Caruso Family Racing, not only with the Pro Mod, but also uh, Camry's Racing. Um, uh, uh, yeah, MGP, MGP Connecting Rod, who was actually, we had Anthony on our little uh, show that we're doing on Caruso Family Racing. Uh, Anthony was on with us yesterday. He is a huge supporter of Caruso Family Racing. Um, <coughs> uh, um, Lucas Oil, VP Racing Fuel. So we, we do have a lot of people that stand behind us, uh, Fuel Tech. Um, so they were, uh, they were all part of that deal and they were, they were all gonna be a part of the Gators too. Unfortunately, that didn't come to be. So hopefully we can get them all back on board when we get to get back down to the Gators in a couple of months. Um, as far as what it takes, um, you know, th th there's, there's variables that are involved with that, obviously, because of travel expenses and, and that type of stuff. So there, there are some sliding scales to, to part of that. But um, I'd say a, a pretty realistic number when it's really, really all said and done, it's probably about $20,000 a race, um, you know, with, with, I mean, everything, just um, – insurances, you know, the things that people don't think about, you know, the, the, the motor home, the trailer, the insurances, um, the travel expenses. Uh, that's probably one of the bigger expenses, quite honestly, is the travel stuff. And then the, the consumables. Um, so there's, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces to make that program happen. And, um, and Alex has been a real big part of why we were in Orlando and why we were going to Gators and we're really hoping um, to continue that. You know, it, it would be a great opportunity. Um, and uh, I think it'd be really cool to see Alex double up in championships in NHRA. That'd be cool. Might as well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hank. <laughs> uh, awesome. $20,000 per race, and I'm sure that actually a large of that is steaks and Tito's, not just mechanical pieces. Oh, he left that part out. <laughs> hey, Lee, I've got to ask, y'all being on the tuning side, what from a sponsor do you want to hear? You know, you don't often hear about tuners interacting with sponsors. So when a driver comes over or a race team seals a sponsor inking the paper, when y'all get that information, what do you hope is in that package? Um... That's a really good question. Um, I really like to deal with ATI because they have some products that I would like to work with and, and make work on the pro mod stuff, on the blown car stuff especially. And they are very open to working with and doing whatever we'd like to make or build or do. You know, they're open for R&D or whatever. Um, the R&D stuff is a really big side to me, so a sponsor that wants to say, hey, uh, what can we work on? What can we develop, make? Um, that, that, that's a really big part of it to me because like, it, like they say, we don't have parts is what we don't have um, because we try to learn and make efficient runs without tearing up parts. So you learn a lot about how things work because you don't have the parts to throw in a trash. So you always come up with new ideas on how to make new things. And, I got some really good people I work with that do that already. Um, Al Billis and and uh, he's he's a huge R and D guy. I think somebody could pay him to play on a dyno all day every day, and he'd be happy. Um, super smart guy. Um, the Noonan's Jamie is a super intelligent guy that has great stuff off the shelf, really. But he's always he's always wanting to go over there and sit and talk about cylinder head stuff and new products and. You know, he, he's always, you know, willing to think up something new and try to come up with some new stuff and how to do things. So, and, uh, you know, like Mark Mickey, we, we work with him and Mark's always willing to pick up the phone and talk for an hour how we can make something work better. So really in my eyes, a, 
from a sponsorship to gather the ability to do R and D work to make everything better. Because just because you run, just because we run good in Orlando, if we can't figure out how to improve and continue to improve, well then you you know it's easy enough to not even qualify. So you, you just always have to be working on improving and. That's, I would love to have a sponsor that says, all right, here's X number of dollars a year that you can, you know, work on making stuff or create whatever you can, whatever your mind can come up with. That's, I would say that would be my best answer. I think that's a great answer. We fund to be able to yep. figure out what is going to help propel the team forward and allow you all to continue to win races. Alex, look, man, you might be one of the most masterful guys out there of cobbling sponsorships together. You know, you've got Power Bill, you've got Haviland, you've got Hot Wheels. I'm surprised Hot Wheels hasn't, hasn't made like a G.I. Joe figure of you with all that you've been in and having them. So how do you work these sponsorship deals out and get so many different brands from really different worlds? You know, you the toy world, the tool world, the automotive world to come together and make your programs possible? Uh, you know, it was, it was been probably three or four years, but I heard one time that it isn't all about your net worth, it's your network. And I couldn't agree more that it literally just comes down to relationships, building relationships, people that you know, people that you, that you can meet. And a lot of it has just been some strange connections, uh, you know, from one place to another. Um, and uh, on the Hot Wheels deal, they actually are, they're, they're building two cars. Uh, one will come out in August, and then one will come out in January. Um, and so those will be cool. I think I will be able to uh, at least release the, uh, what the packaging looks like here in the next couple of weeks. So super excited about that. That's definitely something that every kid could, you know, could only hope for growing up is to have their very own Hot Wheels car. But, uh, you know, I, I do get asked a lot of times um, what it takes to, to get a sponsorship and whatnot. And aside from, you know, um, what I've already said, it's, it's acting right, you know. And I've had, I've had some of the, even the Street Outlaws guys hit me up like, hey, hook me up with, you know, like this suit manufacturer, this helmet manufacturer, like this other sponsor. And, you know, like no offense to them, but they don't really have big brands that they – um, have to stand in front of and represent. And so the way that they carry themselves, how they talk, some of the things they do and that they post, these bigger companies don't really want to be a part of that. And so you just always have to be, you know, clean cut and, uh, and acting right. And, uh, you know, they say good things happen to good, to good people. So I just try to be as good as possible and, and just hope that that's true. Okay. Well, it's working out for you, Alex, and it's very cool that you've been able to take some of those brands with you and hop in a car like the Caruso family racing machine. That is awesome. That's stellar that those things can be worked out in the drag racing world. So, folks, here we are. We're doing this Zoom interview. I've got to ask, what have you all been doing to get yourselves over through this quarantine lockdown time you know myself the caruso family we're up here in new york it is seriously on lockdown so caruso's what have y'all been doing to pass the time working every day I've really going to the office <laughs> and trying to keep it going because at some point uh we're going to get uh, freed up here and uh, want to make sure we still have business that's for sure and trying to stay away from all of the employees and keeping them safe. Um, and we've told all the employees, anyone who doesn't feel comfortable and wants to stay at home, that's fine too. The most important thing is to keep everybody safe. So Papa Joe, that business and those employees that you have, what type of business is that? It has something to do with bathrooms, correct? We're uh, in the uh, kitchen and bath design uh, business. I mean, we uh, represent four or five different major cabinet manufacturers. And uh, we do all of the uh, installations with our own people. Um, we have a large crew and we do probably 70% new housework and 30% remodeling. Um, I've done it most of all of my life. And, uh, and now Mark's been in it 
with me for how many years now? It's got to be, it's lots. Um, that's got to be uh, 18 years. Yeah, 18 yeah. Years. And Camry uh, was working in uh, the business also until she decided she wanted to uh, further her racing career. And uh, so we miss her. It's good to have her home for a little bit now, though. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, like my father said, we are still working every day. Um, we have a rather large showroom. We, we've kind of not really been meeting with new clients as far as the showroom goes, but there's still plenty of jobs out there because of its new construction that we're still measuring. You know, that when, once the houses are done being framed, we measure them. We have plenty of orders to place. We still have tractor trailers coming uh, two, three times a week, delivering cabinets to us. Um, so our business is still going, just the showroom end of it is kind of um, not going the way that it used to. Um, so, uh, and then in the meantime, because um, most of my day would be tied up with meeting with new clients, I don't have that going on right now. And because Camry's home from Elite, uh, her and I have been doing a show every day at three o'clock on Facebook Live called Quarantined with the Carusos, where we're doing a feature called Manufacturers Midday Midway where we're still trying to get um, manufacturers that we work with uh, in our racing uh, program still out there and, and keeping them relevant um, and, and try and get people to still go to their websites, still pick up the phone and call and, and buy their products. Great, y'all have definitely been passing the time well then. And one of those products and one of those groups that you mentioned on your uh, quarantine with the Carusos is that Noonan. So that Noonan group, talk to me about them a little bit very briefly. So the, the way that we got um, hooked up with uh, Noonan uh, was through Lee. Um, and, um, you know, Lee was uh, kind of helping us out with our, our program uh, a little bit and um, talking to us about the 4-9 that Noonan had. Um, and, um, you know, I kept telling him we couldn't afford it. So he went around my back and talked to my father. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, he was having great, he was having great success with it in Al Billis's car at the PDRA. And at that time we were pretty heavy into the PDRA. You know, we, we had finished third, fourth, seventh, you know, in seasons and, um, over there running pro boost. And, um, so an opportunity came and, um, we did have Lee build us a, a four nine and we haven't looked back since. Awesome. Guys, keep up the good work sharing those manufacturers that you're associated with. I know they appreciate it. I know Wes Buck has been doing a similar thing as that with that as well. And he's definitely been able to help out and get business flowing in this challenging time. Speaking of business, how about tuning business? So Hank, Lee, talk to me. What have y'all been doing through this pandemic and lockdown? Seems like the tuners really have been able to stay locked away in the shop, probably where they feel at most home and it's been work as normal. Um, yeah, well, I just moved into a new shop, so I really been just working on getting things set up where I can actually work here. But uh, we got some other projects, we got some new stuff stuff we're working on so hopefully this time will let me get our new stuff done so when we come back out we got some new stuff that, that uh we've been working on with um the noonans and I, I think it'll be better than what we have and i got some other little tuning projects and playing with stuff here and there and we've done some testing at the racetrack with some other stuff and so we, we can still get out and do that here it's not really quite so locked down where we're at I mean, you can't go sit down and eat wings nowhere, but you can still <laughs> rent the racetrack and go, go do some stuff there. So we just continue working on projects, which I'm always a little behind on stuff and a little last minute. So it gives me maybe some time to get caught up. All right, guys. Alex, look, man, I've seen you. You've been trying to burn mystery fluid and chasing a parrot. What else has been going on with you during quarantine? I've still, I've been working out at our, our family business as well, um, you know, trying to keep things going. We've got, you know, kind of a skeleton crew right now, um, being the fact that, you know, we're in the energy business. It's, it's still, uh, uh, you know, one of the places that's, that's, uh, it's okay to be open. Uh, we've told our, our other guys the same thing. If they don't feel comfortable uh, being out and about, absolutely 
more than welcome to stay home. Uh, but besides that, I don't know if anybody has seen it yet. Tiger King on Netflix. That is, uh, that's new and it's only uh, seven episodes long. Um, and the guy, the main guy, Joe Exotic, his, his zoo there is literally across the street uh, from the race shop in Oklahoma. And so I've heard stories about this zoo for years and years now, and it is quite something to get into. Um, and uh, it's actually one of the most viral series on Netflix right now. So if you are uh, you watch it, you watch it. bored, you got, you got to watch The Tiger King. You absolutely cannot write the story. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I finished it last night. And what did you think? I'm just glad they oh. finally found it. Chase Freeman's real dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Definitely an interesting show. That lady totally fed her husband to the Tigers. I couldn't agree more. Yep. I'm halfway through it. Yeah. Well, if you haven't watched it, watch it. I'm telling you, it's worth it. Awesome. Passing the time on Netflix. Uh, with the Tiger King, I understand a little bit better now what everybody's been talking about. I've been doing all this research for racing stuff and no time for Netflix for me. I've been working hard myself on the other end of the media side of things. Folks, look, when we get back to drag racing right now, as it stands, the first event will be the rescheduled Gator Nationals. Now, the Gator Nationals, they're usually ran Early in the year, they're the third event currently on the NHRA schedule. They're the first showing for the Pro Mod cars in the NHRA. I've got to ask, a hot Gator Nationals, what do you think is going to be the challenges to get a car down that strip in those conditions? Uh, Hank, Lee, how about y'all pick this one up first? I don't know. Hank, Hank will work it out. No. I'm a glorified truck driver. You uh, know, it's uh, we've thought we just had that conversation yesterday. It's definitely going to be different because every time you're in Gainesville, you're used to having really good air, and it's going to be miserably hot. The racetrack's going to be really, really hot. Um, so it it'll be uh, way, way different. And I don't know. We'll probably just uh, wing it and work it out when we get there. No worries. The rest of you. Yeah, camera figure it all out. Got it. That's right. I just, you know, this is the way I look at it. Everybody's, everybody's got to go down the same racetrack, right? And yeah, I've, uh, I've heard that before. <laughs> and uh, I kind of like our odds with uh, Lee White tuning it and Alex driving it, and Hank Jackson and Camry overseeing everything. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody got to be somebody. <laughs> Camry's going to get the job done no matter what. She's got it under control. Correct. She tells herself that every day. Alex, look, with you in a pro stock, in the pro mod, when you go to a track and it's not in its normal time-slotted place, like the Gator Nationals will be in several other races this year, do you... <laughs> Do you try to put that out of your mind? Do you not try to get psyched over that? Do you, in, or do you instead try to prepare yourself like, wow, I'm going to go out here and this thing's probably going to have to be something I need to pedal and get down the track. You know, what's your thoughts from the driver's seat? Honestly, um, I prefer to not have any idea, you know, even if, if there, if it's going to be a hot tune up or something and it's got potential to shake or something, I don't want to have anything else. Uh, to think about because essentially I want to go up and stage the car every single time like it's going to do the same thing every time so that I am as consistent as I can be and if something happens then I'll react at that point and you know use my best judgment uh, to make the best decision from there. All right now Alex you mentioned earlier about the toys coming out with Hot Wheels and that's that's cool I'm glad to see that because I think NHRA Pro Stocks and NHRA Pro Mods are screaming to be Hot Wheels cars, just like Wes Buck said. And look, toys help introduce fans, young fans, into the sport 
and I'll m possibly make them lifelong fans. I know for me, one of my favorite diecasts when I was a kid was my little Bob Wooden car that I would race with, and he won all my pro stock drag races that I would run on my desk when I was a kid. So, Alex, we'll start with you. What do you think the NHRA needs to do to expand its fan experience and get more people at the track and more people following NHRA drag racing? Because I think the NHRA has the greatest drag racing product on the planet. They just don't know what to do with it. And you can see that that is possibly the case because look at the popularity of something like no prep. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a lot of the reason that the people do like the no prep stuff is because there's so much drama and that's what people just love and follow these days with all of the different reality shows and whatnot. Um, you're right. NHRA has the best show of race cars that you can ask for. You know, you've got cars that make 11,000 horsepower. They go 300 miles an hour and blow up. They, you know, shoot fire and flames everywhere. You've got the pro mods that are all over the place and unpredictable. You know, you've got the pro stock cars that that are doing so much with the little amount, you know, that they've got to work with. And so as, as far as, as what the fans are watching, it is the best of the best, but there does have to be something to spice it up. It is so vanilla, you know, that, you know, you just go through qualifying just from one race to the next, it's the exact same. Nobody has any problems with anybody else, even though everybody really, especially in pro stock, pretty much can't stand each other. But, you know, <laughs> they put, they put a, a camera in their face, you know, they're like, oh no, you know, that was a good race, whatever, you know, and they're all just like always so respectful, which is, is totally good to be respectful on, on one point. But hey man, if you don't like the guy, like just tell him like, you know, I, I, I don't think I don't think he's a good driver, you know, like a lot of the times that uh, I get up on the stage on like the uh, Sunday morning matchups, you know, uh, they ask me, you know, how I feel about first round. I'm like, all I know is I usually beat this dude because he's terrible. So I'm not really that worried <laughs> about it. So, you know, and the, the people, you know, that are there watching, they like it, they laugh, they cheer. And, uh, you know, you just, you just got to spice it up a little bit. The chip draw at Orlando was super cool. I think, I think doing that even every single round, first round call outs, uh, kind of bring it back to the grassroots style. Another reason people like the street outlaw stuff is because the people can relate to the cars that they're racing on there a lot of the times. And uh, to be able to, to have the first round call outs and whatnot, like that's something that, that can happen at, you know, somebody's local drag strip, you know, in their Honda Civic, if, that, if that's what they show up in. And uh, anything that kind of helps connect the fans to the, the sport um, on even a, an emotional level like that, um, it all helps. And there's a, here's the thing, times change, things change. And, uh, you know, they, they, they have to evolve with the times, do something different, you know, you're not gonna lose anything. So give it a shot. I agree with you, man. Definitely some things need to happen to spice it up. I love the chip draw there at Orlando myself. I was disappointed there was no call out. So I was hoping there'd be a big call out. But yeah, I think, you know, in NHRA qualifying, it'd be pretty cool if like, Greg Anderson called out Erica for some big money just on a qualifying, you know, one one heads up match race, you know, you, you're not racing for points there, you're going to race for some money. I think that'd be pretty cool for fans TV to see something like that. So, definitely they need to spice it up. Crusoe's look. Pro Mod has always had a bit of an edge to it. It kind of comes out of those outlaw ranks and it's now becoming dignified being in the NHRA. I've got to ask, do you still think it has that edge? Does it need to still be edgy? Would y'all have liked to have done the chip draw there at Orlando, those type of things? Yeah, actually, I was I was really bummed out when uh, I found out that ProMod wasn't having the chip draw. I didn't, I didn't realize they weren't. Um, I thought that was really cool. And no, I think I think ProMod definitely still has its edge. Um, you know, one of the big things to kind of circle back on your question to Alex there is I. I think NHRA just needs to realize that they're in the entertainment business and not the drag racing business. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're all there to drag race and we're all there because we're competitive and we don't care 
who's in the other lane. If I rolled up in the, the water box and Camry's in the other lane, I'm still looking to make her eyes bleed when I let go of that button. But you wouldn't. Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the bottom line is, and, and, and that the chip draw right there, that's entertainment. That's entertaining. The call outs, it's entertainment. It's entertaining. There's so much in the world today that people can go um, and pay and get an entertainment value for. And NHRA, the minute NHRA realizes that and starts having, you know, concerts in the pits or, or chip draws or, you know, all that stuff, um, that's, that's what's going to make the value for the ticket um, even more valuable. And, and I think we just, we need to see more of that. I mean, Wes's race, it was entertaining. It never, ever stopped being entertaining, even down to the uh, racer's appreciation dinner party. I mean, the, the whole thing from the minute you pulled in there to the minute Camry and Alex backed the car into the pit, it was entertainment. The whole thing was entertainment. Yeah, Wes Buck definitely made a great show down there in Orlando. You had stellar drag racing with NHRA Pro Stock and Pro Mod. You had the Outlaw 632, Top Sportsman, a great bracket field crowd. You, you had the DJ out there. You had the party there Friday night. I mean, man, just need a DJ and Courtney Enders dancing. That's a show in and of itself. I mean, I mean that it's it's all it was all a great show. It was really really good. So I'm looking forward to World Door Slammer Nationals 2. I'm definitely looking forward to that. So, Hank, Lee, let me ask you, yes, you're tuning. Yes, you're in this field, been in it for a while. But from a fan standpoint, what are some things you'd like to see the NHRA do to expand the experience? I don't know. Um fans are awesome you know the, the part of the best part of being there is when you know you got kids that come over and they see the car and you set them in the car you know it's, it's really cool because it's 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 that's what you know it's the thing you remember when you're a kid but um you know i personally like watching you know it, I, I never watch nhr on tv because it's boring um in my opinion pro mod pro stock is kind of one of the best categories to watch because they're interesting i mean if you've ever been to watch a fuel car run, I mean, they do the same thing. They, they're loud, they either go down the racetrack or they don't, or, or they may blow up. But it's, you know, you, you never you never know what you're gonna get with a pro mod car. You know, it, it might wheelie through the middle of the racetrack. It, it might turn sideways anywhere on the racetrack. You know, it may not leave a start line, but you just never know. But I feel like pro mod stuff has a lot of character and it's, and it's just really good drag racing and pro stocks the same all the racing is just it's side by side you know and that's what people like to see you know there's there's not really one team that dominates each class and so you know it's it's always interesting in, in the pro mod category i can say whether you're first or 16th you, you have just as good a chance of winning the race if you can qualify you have a le fairly legit chance of winning and you know, that's what people like to see. People don't like to see one person just crush everybody all the time. So. All right. This is awesome. All right. So great ideas there on the expanding fan experience there in the NHRA. Thank you guys for chiming in on that. Now, obviously, we're with you all, we're in the pro mod ranks. That's the class that you all are running in. Alex has also got the exception of work driving in the pro stocker where do you think the state of nhra pro mod is right now you know i asked ricky smith you know is 12 races enough would you want more is it less you know where are y'all's thoughts on schedule the tracks where you all are going to and how the nhra works with pro mod go ahead caruso's well, I can tell you with, with the funding we have right now, we, <laughs> we're lucky to do 12. Um, so it's, um, you know, a lot of that comes down to funding, right? You know, if you, if you, you don't, you don't see the major marketing partners in pro mod as you much as you do in pro stock now is as NHRA opens up and accepts pro mod as a professional category, the more opportunities are going to be there. 
you know, and they are, they're making an effort. They've made a little bit more of an effort last year of including us in the mellow yellow TV coverage. Um, they're supposed to be doing even more of that this year. So as long as that continues to happen and the funding can be there, um, you know, I think that's really what it boils down to is um, the funding is how many races you can go to. So I, I think that um, 12 is a good number right now because of funding. You know, if there was more funding there, maybe 16 is a good number. I would never, ever, ever want to see it 23. Most people in Pro Modified are business owners and have businesses to run. So I think, I don't think you'll, I mean, I, look at look at what brought the life back to Pro Stock when they curtailed it back to 18 races. Man, it, it, it was like someone gave it a steroid shot. So um, I don't know that I'd want to see it much more than 12, maybe a couple more. There's a couple more tracks that I think, you know, I think they should be at Norwalk. They're not at Norwalk this year. So I don't know if that means moving a race or adding a race, um, but I think it's crazy for Pro Mod not to be at Norwalk. Um, but, uh, I, I, you know, one of the things, and I, I, I kind of joked about it a little bit, but the more I thought about it, I really mean it. I, I said to the guys, we ought to, after Alex drove the car back from the pits after we won and he backed it into the pit, I said, we ought to start backing it into the pit while we're working on it at the races from now on, like the pro stockers do. And the more I kind of, I was joking about it at the time, but the more I thought about it, it really is a great idea. You know, when people, when fans, um, you know, Saturday at Wes's race, there was, the pits were like a national event with uh, fans walking through there. And I mean, how cool would it be if the car was back then and they really did get a good look at that Noonan 4.9 and when we're warming it up. And so I kind of joked about it, but I think, I think we might start doing it. Well, that sounds good, Mark. Look, I know from the Nitro pit standpoint, the teams that put the engine of the Top Field Dragster furthest away from you annoys me. I'm like, I would be right here as close as I can when that car is warming up. Most teams have already taken away the throttle whack anyway, and, and to get that, i got to go down to Pro Mod now. I think Pro Mod probably has some of the better warm-ups in the drag racing pits as it stands now. So that's a good idea, Mark. Definitely need to implement that. So, Hank, Lee, talk to me. With the state of NHRA Pro Mod, more races, no race, no, you know, 12 races or less races, what does it look like for you as tuners? Is it challenging to get the turnaround? You want that time for that R&D? You know, what's it look like on the tuning side? Um, basically, it's uh, whatever they give us is what will work, make work. Um, I think 10 to 12 races for the way I believe Pro Mod will be funded is probably a good number. Um, I don't know that Pro Mod will ever reach the level of fuel car funding, right? And and if you run 20-something races, you got to have a whole bunch of money because traveling – you have to have more people working for you because you have, have less time to get things done, less time to service cars, less time to make sure everything's right. So I think funding-wise, yeah, I, I think 12 is plenty, especially when you start traveling west and really getting spread out. And then they, you know, some of the races that are three in a row or, you know, if it's, you know, it's, it's usually just me and Hank, um, we do everything. So, you know, it, it, it can get pretty tough. You, if, if you did much more than that, you would have to hire another full-time person. And then it starts getting pretty expensive, you know. So, yeah, that, I, I think 12 races is plenty. And unless, I, I just don't think they'll ever get to the fuel car deal where, you know, they got major sponsorship. You mean we got to get What's that? Yeah, yeah, eventually we start getting paid for this stuff. God. I'm going to have to get a part-time job. Well, Lee, thank you. I've never really thought of that aspect, that more races would mean more people to have on the staff. Therefore, man, that labor, labor just kills, I tell you. If everybody would just work for free and peanut, there would be no problem at all. But, uh, and it's really hard to find. It is. It is really hard to find, in, especially in this day and time. As the old saying goes, it's hard to find good help these days. But some good nice. help y'all do have is Mr. Laughlin over here. He has double duty at a lot of races. Alex, look, I have a curious question. I know that there's two different fire suits for Pro Stock and Pro Mod. 
why don't you guys just wear the ProMon fire suit into the Pro Stock car? Do you have to wear that particular fire suit, or is it just that they're that hot? It isn't. It isn't so much of uh, the fact that it's hotter. It's a little bit hotter, but it isn't that much. But it's much heavier. And as far as moving my entire leg on the clutch pedal, um, the shoes are different. The suit is heavier. And so I always change into the lighter suit for the pro stock car with the lighter weight shoe just to, you know, make your reaction time just that much faster. So um, I have ran um, the pro mod suit and pro stock before, and I have seen a difference um, consistently. So if I do have time, I definitely prefer uh, to change suits for sure. But also on the, like on the 12 race deal too, I agree that, uh, the 12 is good. Like Mark said, most of the guys uh, that run ProMod are business owners and uh, and they still run and maintain their, their own businesses. So they, one, have to have the time for that. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of them too, it's just, it's a hobby. And it's, I mean, it's literally the most expensive hobby that you could probably have. And to add more races, that that is more uh, commitment because ultimately everybody wants to be able to race for a championship. And so you start adding up, um, adding races like for pro stock, even now we're running 18 races and just our travel bills. And, you know, I've got a smaller team, um, but between just my expenses from uh, insurance, paying my people, fuel, hotels, flights and whatnot, we still spend almost $300,000 a year aside from anything racing. That's, that's just to, to operate and manage the people. And so that ends up getting outrageous, you know? And so um, I actually wouldn't mind seeing pro stock get reduced down to, to a little bit more personally, because I still like to go to pro mod to run pro mod and pro stock both if I can. So, Hey, if we ran 12 and 12, uh, I think that would be perfect for me really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with you doing double duty, I'm sure you enjoy that, and you would probably prefer that on a race weekend. What are some of the challenges, though, when you're not, when you are doing double duty, instead of you know just running the pro stock car? Because you know, honestly, it looks like a lot of times with the pro stock guys that y'all have a lot of almost free time. I hate to use it that way, but there's times where y'all are just waiting, especially especially on Friday, especially qualifying. And Saturday, it seems like you're just kind of waiting around, ready to make the run. Sunday is obviously fast-paced, but what do you like about the double-duty weekends and what is also challenging? Honestly, what I like about it is kind of the, the stress, really, of having to go back and forth. There is downtime, for sure, on the pro stock side. There's downtime on the pro mod side where, you know, you're waiting, you know, a lot of the times you're, you're both waiting at the same time, but the cars or the categories always run pretty close together. And so it is stressful to, and that's the challenge is, is the shortness of, of time because we do run together. And so there's plenty of times that I've literally gotten out of the race car at the end of the racetrack, hopped on a scooter, weighed myself with my helmet on the scales where the car was going to come up and they're going to have to add my weight and the car weight to figure out exactly where we are. Cause I have to meet the next car in the staging lanes to you know, buckle in and and make another pass. And I'm a thinker. I'm my own worst enemy sometimes on on uh, you know how I drive. If I've been struggling on a tree, like whatever my problems could be. Um, so whenever I'm busy uh, hopping from car to car, I think less about anything else other than get here to there and and make a good run. And so I actually think that I. Uh, and more competitive and a better driver whenever I do have to race two cars. Awesome, man. All right, folks, I'm going to begin to wind this interview down. So I'm going to give each one of you one more question. And after I ask you that question, please go ahead and plug in any social media partners that you want to share about, maybe anyone special that's been a big help to you. Hey, Lee, here's my last question for you. We have a new power adder coming into NHRA Pro Mod this year. Talk to me. What's your thoughts on the Pro Charger boys? Um, hmm. If they get a white rule drop, it'll be good. But they sandbagging at the moment. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, everybody seen Justin Bond go 62? Yeah, but that wasn't on purpose. Hey. Well, the person that didn't get the memo from petting them not to go that fast. Because <laughs> you notice they never went no faster than a 66 with Jose's car. They went 66 and then slowed it down. Play nice. I don't know. I, I think the Pro Charger stuff's good. I think it'd be good for the class. Um, I wouldn't mind running a Pro Charger car. I, I, would, I wouldn't mind having one in my hands to run. So I think it'd be a good package. Um, I think it's got some major potential to, to we, be we want really to I'll drive it. Hey, Lee. I can drive yeah. it. Do we have time to put one together before the next yeah, race? Sure. All yeah. right. Let's start. Um, I, I, I think they're a good deal. Um, Proline really makes it look easy, but Proline is very well put together. Petty's really good. Um, there are definitely no dummies over there. They came out prepared, so they ran good. Where Maybe some people were not as prepared as, you know, they were. But I think it would be good. NHR will do their best to keep the rules as fair as possible, and we'll just try to outwork them. If, if, I don't care if they got more power or not. We'll just outwork them and try to think better than them. Amen. That's all we can do. Hank Lee, you have any partners that you would like to thank or anyone else you'd like to give a shout-out to? Just all the support we get from everybody, you know. Uh, getting Orlando was crazy. You know, Jamie, Renee, and Daryl at Noonan, anytime I need something, they usually drop anything they need and get it to me and get it done. Because, um, you know, a lot of times if I'm supposed to have something to them on Monday, I might not get it to them on Thursday when I need it Thursday. So they're usually really good at getting stuff done for me. Um, Justin Elks did a great job on, on the car. Everything he did – when it was at his shop with all the new safety stuff, worked perfect. I didn't have to worry about anything. Um, Alan Pittman done a bunch of work for us on another car to help get to Orlando. And, you know, th there was a whole lot that went into us getting Orlando when we did, even though it was a little late getting there. Um, me and Hank really worked, I don't even know how many hours the week before Orlando. Uh, we drove down there with no sleep. He drove down there with no sleep. I tried to stay awake. It didn't work out. But um, you know, just Alex, I'm, I'm I'm glad I'm glad the deal came through with Alex. I'm looking forward for the rest of our races. And uh, in the beginning, I think I might have bullied him a little bit just to kind of check his personality out. But he took it well, so it all worked out. Uh, I'm looking forward to racing the rest of the year. Awesome, awesome. Who who joined us all of a sudden? We've noticed that someone's been running around there. <laughs> this is my little princess, Bristol. Hi, Bristol. <laughs> she, uh, she's been with me since I got back because they don't have school right now, so she comes to the shop with me every day. Awesome. It's like a, it's like a daddy daycare also, so. <laughs> There's bicycles and hoverboards and stuff riding around. Daddy daycare at the Pro Mod Shop. That sounds pretty cool to me. Mr. Laughlin, I am dying to ask. Last year, maybe even about this time, you put a photo out on Facebook, I believe Instagram too, and I haven't heard any more news on it. Maybe you can talk with this gang and it worked out. Is the Davy Allison tribute card still a possibility? You know, it, I think it could be. Um, I, I took that to Haviland, and they – they had some certain uh, political reserves on it. They did like the idea of it. They just weren't completely positive if it, if it was something that they should uh, uh, get behind or not. Um, that is something that we've talked about because this year at Indy, uh, Woody from JEGS does want to do a, uh, a throwback. Uh, since it's the 50th year of Pro Stock, and uh, and everybody has some type of uh, retro themed uh, design on the Pro Stock, okay. I think that you might see something similar uh, coming out sometime around September. Then, cool man, cool. And I know I said one more question, but with you bringing up some throwback things, you know, you talking with other drivers and across the classes. Do you think the NHRA, even though it has the nostalgia ranks, needs a throwback race, kind of like what Darlington's doing with the Southern 500? I think all of that's cool, especially because um, 
you know, a lot of a lot of the NHRA demographic it is, you know, an older fan base. And so these are people that have been watching for years and years. And so to uh, to give them something to to throw back to and, and just kind of reconnect those dots and memories too, I think I think is always a, a pretty cool deal for sure. Stellar man. Well look, you can find Alex just about on any social media platform and he keeps folks entertained. Go follow him, Instagram, Twitter. Facebook, YouTube, and don't go watch Reaper videos. It's a it's a whole rabbit hole. Do not watch them. <laughs> On now to Caruso's look, Mark. I've got to end with this because I watched it live, if I remember correctly. Dude, you took a hard slam at Bristol last year, and I remember watching it. No shoots popped out, and I'm like, oh no. And then I thought to myself, I'm glad that that turn is no longer there at Bristol and it's actually got the pit that it does now. Walk me through that run and what you can remember and what it's been like for you to recover from that. Well, so to kind of put it in perspective, because, um, you know, I know it's, it's real simple, you know, for a lot of people to Monday morning quarterback some stuff. Um, and I've been guilty of it myself. Um, you know, you really don't know unless you're the person going through uh, the circumstance. But, um, you know, kind of like uh, most drivers, um, when you've got a routine, you've got a routine, and a lot of it um, ends up becoming muscle memory. Um, my parachutes were activated off of a button on the steering wheel, and, um, you know, quarter mile racing, there's a big difference um, between both parachutes come out or only one parachute coming out and q1 i can remember it as clear as it just happened 20 minutes ago q1 went through the traps hit the button and i got on the radio to lee i said do i not have any parachutes and uh, he goes no you got one the other one's tangled um i got on the brakes made the turn just fine came to a stop just fine uh on the return road q2 q3 parachutes both parachutes came out just fine i mean it's literally a negative g when both those parachutes hit you you know you it's it's a negative g you feel it um q4 left the starting line was on a real good run went through the traps hit the button didn't feel anything so the very first thing i thought was i got one parachute the other one must be tangled went to get on the brake pedal brake pedal went right to the floor at that moment my first instinct was to start pumping the brake pedal. Well, by the time I maybe second or third pump, I knew I was going in the sand. I centered up and went in the sand, and the rest is history. Um, you know, in hindsight, which I've had a lot of time to have and do, um, the minute the brake pedal went to the floor, um, I should have reached up and verified that the chutes were even out. Unfortunately, uh, the air bottle was low, and that's why the shoots didn't deploy when I pushed the button, hence the new rule. There you go, man. We're glad that you came out of it. And we, I understand you're still recuperating, but, you know, you got out of the car and we're walking under your own power. So definitely glad that all the safety equipment worked and uh, you're with us still today uh, through a door car crash. Well, folks. This is the Monday Morning Racer, Lee Craft for DragRacing.tv, brought to you by Strutmasters.com. This has been an interview with Mark, Papa Joe, Camry Caruso, Alex Laughlin, Hank, and Lee. And these guys, they won the first ever in Pro Mod, the World Door Slammer Nationals. Drag Racing fans, we hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>